Hello, everyone. Welcome to Infineo's Twitter space. Let's, uh... Seems like people are trickling in. Let's wait a minute here until we get to the official starting time, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start. We'll get going. Awesome. Um, so, I'm going to start off with... Thanks, for, thanks everyone, for, for joining. We're going to start off with introducing um, Bob and Christian, who are, um, who are two sort of uh, main figures for this Twitter space. Um, and I'll start with Bob. So Bob, uh, or Dr. Rob Mur Murphy, is, as many people know him, um, has a PhD from NYU, New York University, and he is the resident chief economist at Infineo. And he has a, a very sort of uh, interesting history in the Austrian School of Economics. Um, and so this space is really to, to sort of um, dive into AI, how it interfaces with the economy, and specifically investing, um, and how that sort of interplay works with, with deep learning as well. And so... Um, Bob, do you want to say a few words about yourself and then I'll introduce uh, Christian? Thanks, Zuhar. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, yeah, we're, just, we're glad to have you here. I think if you're following me because you saw the Twitter link, you probably know who I am. But yeah, I'm a member of the Austrian School of Economics. I also, when I was younger, was a huge computer nerd. That probably doesn't shock many of you to hear. I also dabbled in watching Star Trek a lot. Um, and so, yeah, this, this is really the intersection of a lot of interesting things. So I just want to stress at the outset that I promise you this stuff with AI, it's way more than just, oh, wow, the computer can carry on a conversation in the style of, you know, Donald Trump. Ha ha. Like this, this is really, you know, that's partly what I want to get into in the, in this particular space. So I, I'll stop there and, and let uh, Zuhar introduce uh, our other main uh, guest today. Hey, um, so the other two people that we have speaking today, a very interesting mix of sort of expertise on the panel. And I just want to thank you, Christian, for um, for being able to join us. So Christian is a um, has had an appearance on the Infi podcast with um, with Bob, and so he he actually is a PhD in machine learning. So we have two PhDs on stage today um, from Carnegie Mellon, and um, yeah, Christian, um, you are the AI expert on the panel. Uh, I'll let you introduce yourself and maybe speak a little bit about your history. And then um, we'll go on to Lawyered. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, just for quick background, because I don't have uh, much of an online presence. <laughs> so um, many people probably have no idea who I am. Um, but I, I did do my doctorate at uh, Carnegie Mellon, um, focused on the intersection of um, really optimization and reinforcement learning. Um, and I have been working in the area of machine learning since probably about 2015, 2016, I first started getting interested in that um, and namely applying it to a lot of large-scale industrial problems, um, chemical development, other things in, in that area. And so that's really where my my background um, and and expertise comes from. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm, I am I think I'd echo with, uh, with um, what uh, Bob said about the excitements of this technology. I mean, I've been, I've been, you know, here for quite a while, you know, working on this kind of stuff. Uh, but it, it's cool to see it really kind of um, bubble up and capture the public attention. And it's far more than making poems and so forth. It's it's a, it's a work process that I've been using uh, daily but to incorporate AI into a lot of decision-making and so forth and to help out in designing other AI systems and so forth. And so it's it's really cool to see uh, how this is how this has quickly blossomed and developed and um, I'm, I'm very optimistic and excited for for the future of the technology. Awesome. Thanks, Christian. And last but not least, we have Lloyd. Um So Lloyd is uh, in-house counsel at Infineo. And um, he is a business lawyer, but he avidly uses AI. And he's probably the most tech-forward lawyer. And he runs the most tech-forward practice that I've ever uh, seen myself. And... Um, yeah, lawyer. Why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, I mean, so that's exactly right. I'm I just you know obsessed with using AI as much as I can all day. Uh, and you know, as a lawyer, you know, within limit, you know, you have to know the limitations, right? 
Um, this is if I had, it's the same as if I had like an employee below me who wasn't a lawyer. I still have to make sure everything coming out of the office is, you know, up to, up to snuff. I can't rely on it and just assume, you know, the research it does is fine. Um, but when it comes to like drafting emails or drafting a clause in a contract, that's something I want to see. I can look at it after and say, oh, you know, actually tweak it that way. And, um, you know, it's just been so interesting to see how, you know, I almost find myself giggling all day, you know, like, well, that was easy and it's so new and they keep making it better. So, you know, I think I have a pretty good vantage point in terms of how knowledge workers can use this stuff because I have such a, um, a broad type of work that I do on my computer and I see how much of it I'm able to 10x myself. Um, and then, you know, you think of other, and like for this discussion, I think about if my job was allocating capital, how would that look in, you know, now and then in the near future when it's even, you know, more robust. Um, so yeah, I'm just very interested in this stuff. Amazing. Great. So we have our, uh, our three panelists here. Um, just to reiterate, hey, one is an, hey, Zubat is a lawyer and yeah, go ahead. May, can you, I'm, may I forgot if you did this and I forgot, can you just explain your, your background? I mean, because you're, uh, you're not, you're no stranger to computers yourself. Yeah, actually, um, good idea. <laughs> so I'm, I'm the CEO of Infineo. Uh, and so I'll also be contributing to this space. Um, so my expertise is not necessarily in AI specifically, but um, I have been a full stack developer for over a decade. And so, using things in production applications and optimizing processes with whatever tools I have available to me is sort of my, uh, the, the way that I have been implementing AI. And so that's, uh, I believe a little bit different than the way Christian, um, at least from, from his sort of background, uh, has been, a, he's, he's much more on the, um, on the deep research side, as far as I understand, but also practical application. So I'm sort of a subset. I do a subset of what Christian does. Um, uh, I, and correct me if that's an incorrect characterization, Christian. But um, yeah, I think, I think I'm think i very excited to to hear what the panelists have to say. And I, I really think that we have a very diverse set of uh, expertise here. And I think that the conversation will, will turn out to be quite interesting. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for the reminder. So, um, Bob, do you want to introduce the topic? And we can go from there. Yeah, sure thing. So um, I, I know some of you have been tuning in. Let me just dive right into the, the thing that I want to get across. And then, you know, the other speakers feel free to, you know, whatever you think the most important thing is, because I know some people were, were just catching them at lunch or whatever. Um, so, yeah, my, my main thing here is I, I've seen there's like a if you guys know Spencer Schiff, Peter Schiff's son, and I'm sure eventually, you know, Spencer will be sick of people identifying as such. Uh, he he's just been over the moon about the potential of AI to revolutionize like everything, and um, if for you know people were kind of teasing him, but the more I've been looking into this, the, I'm not fully where he is. I mean, he kind of thinks everyone's going to live to be ten thousand years old and stuff, which actually sounds horrifying to me. But um, it, it really is like I, I I'm telling you, like, I just did a, an exercise last night where I, the, Stephanie Kelton had a tweet, and I thought there was a subtle thing wrong with it, and even a lot of like anti-MMT people, in my view, were, were missing like the real problem. And I literally had what can only be described as an intelligent conversation with ChatGPT4 where we discussed it. And again, these verbs, I'm not saying it was as if, I mean, it, it, no, unless you're just going to say, no, I refuse to believe anything that's not a homo sapien can talk and have a conversation, then fine. If that's what you're going to say, okay, fair enough. But I had a conversation with this thing and we spelled out the issues that were involved with her tweet and blah, blah, blah. And at the end, you know, it was a very amicable, friendly discussion. And so my point is, in terms of the economic impact of that, it's it's as if any business that has a telecommuting employees, right? So you can't have a guy in the warehouse moving stuff around with his hands. If you're using AI, you know, just per se, chat GPT per se, you kind of just somehow embed it into a robot. But any kind of job right now where you rely on employees who don't come into the office physically and they're just sending stuff to you over the internet, like every business is going to need to sit down and think, is there a way we can, you know, outsource that job to an AI to chat GPT four or whatever? And I ran some numbers and the effective um, cut to the chase, it's like you could get an employee that's reasonably intelligent and very knowledgeable about a lot of issues. And hire them for about two dollars and fifty cents an hour. Is you know my back of the envelope calculation. So I just thought, even if 
if AI development stops and chat GPT doesn't get any better than it was last night when I had that conversation that I put, posted on my Twitter account, easily U.S. GDP could go up by 11% just as all the businesses right now that rely on telecommuting workers figure out how to outsource and, and take care of that kind of stuff, right? So, I mean, this is back of the envelope, but it's, that's not like forever. I'm just saying that's a one-shot adjustment. But I'm just saying, so for people who say that, oh, yeah, this is just some, you know, silly little toy, it's no big deal. I, I really think you're underestimating the potential impact. Okay, I'll uh, turn it over. I'm curious what other people want to say. Yeah, I mean, it's obvious to me, like, I've always been afraid to have staff at my practice because, you know, I'm just not a manager and I've always had bad managers when I, you know, just not my, I was afraid of it. So I've never had help. And now I literally, it would be insane for me to hire someone because I have infinity people to, you know, to do the, the help. And if I had people and I actually was, you know, trusted to worry about the bottom line, let's say by shareholders, I think it'd be incumbent on me to start looking at how to like take four people and make one of them do the other four's work. So it's incredible to me what it must be feeling like for people in that position and what that looks like in terms of our, you know, our workforce and, and knowledge workers in general. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I was just going to make it, make a comment. Sorry, Christian, go ahead. No, no, go for it. Go for it. I'll, I'll jump in later. No, I was just going to say that, um, I mean, it, it, it's sort of a, a very commonly used analogy, but, um, for those here who haven't heard it, um, the way that dishwashers sort of made it more efficient, the process of dishwashing, but did not necessarily eliminate all dishwashers part of the labor force. Um, AI seems to be doing that at this moment in time. Uh, so it's really not eliminating jobs yet, but it does seem to be enhancing the pro productive output per unit of, of time for or effort for laborers. And uh, and this this is actually like cognitive labor rather than well, mostly cognitive labor rather than uh, uh, sort of manual labor. Um, and so what's interesting is that you see the same sort of abstract structure playing out uh, that is that has happened before, but um, in a more uh, sort of in, in in a different form of, of work. And so I, I was wondering, Christian, is that characterization accurate? Would you say that that's what's happening with this sort of revolution when it comes to to business, or would you would you explain it differently? Uh, I mean, I would say, yeah, it's definitely augmenting the knowledge workers. And I think that there are a lot of opportunities to use, you know, um, this version of AI. And so far, we've just been referring to large language models, you know, the generative AI type of approach um, focused in large language models. And there are different uh, modalities. You can do language to uh, text to, to, to image. And, and there are other things. My area is really more on optimization um, and using reinforcement learning, which is actually a different area <laughs> of, of AI. But this generative AI approach um, has, is really tremendous to, to be able to um, yeah. just boost boost productivity across the board. Uh, I like to say that you know if you're a, if you're a startup or you know you're you're an entrepreneur or a small business owner, uh, you know now you have somebody who's who's uh, kind of your right hand man that's able to. Um, handle a, a lot of different tasks that you don't need to outsource anymore. I can do it very competently. So it, it really just raises the floor. So maybe you're not good at writing sales copy or something like that, but you can turn to uh, Chat GPT and get a pretty decent letter off off out of the uh, out of the gate. You know, maybe it's not uh, uh, going to be the best copy ever, but it's probably better than what you could have done without any practice or or anything like that. It just um, yeah, just with a, a quick, simple, easy prompt, and then you pay twenty bucks a month to you know open AI for in this case, or uh, you know if you want to run your own model, you can do that too. But um, and you can get something much better <laughs> on top of that, and that's just it's, it's just tremendous um, uh, capability. And then uh, on top of that, there there is uh, if you're working with an expert, one thing I've seen, uh, you also know your domain, but you also know the system very well and how to interact with that, how to prompt it, how to um, talk to it more or less to, to get the answers that you're after, it can be even more powerful. So this is where I think it's not fully replacing a lot of people um, or, or and might not for, for some time, but can really be that augment, um, can really augment uh, their, their capabilities. So for example, um, you know, I, I, I'll 
build a model uh, for for some of the work that I'm doing. And I can go reference some papers and try to look up, oh, exactly how that's mathematically formulated or so forth. Um, or I can ask ChatGPT real quick how to formulate it. And maybe it isn't right when it, when it gives me the, the response right away. Uh, but I can iterate with it pretty quickly. And I can and I have that expertise and background to say, okay, I know it's wrong here, but let's try to work on something and then know how to prompt it to actually make it better than maybe what I would have come up with just off the top of my head. And I can do that very quickly. You know, maybe this is a whole 15 minute process, whereas before it would have been trying to check a couple of different papers and cross uh, uh, reference um, some different sources in order to come uh, come up with the same sort of end result, which may have been a couple of hours of work to actually develop the same um, thing and result for the, for the customer, for the user in my case. If, yeah, if I could jump in a second, um, you just said something, Christian, there that resonated, and, and I've seen Zuhar, you, you were the first person that actually opened my eyes to this, and then I know lawyered that, you know, you use it as, as well. That And so for people who maybe, like when the, when Chad GPT first became, like like at the 3.5, I think is when like it got big enough that I started paying attention. And so if you played with it like eight months ago and just thought, oh yeah, huh, that's kind of funny, and then you moved on with your life, I don't blame you because the thing is you have to prompt it correctly. So the specific example I have in mind when I realized I had been using it incorrectly was, or inadequately, let's say, is that we had, we had to send an email to somebody about some sensitive issue. And it was, it was like, we had to be careful with the client and Zuhar showed us. And he said, Hey guys, what do you think of this draft? And I was surprised by what a good writer Zuhar was. And then I, I complimented him. I was like, wow, this is very eloquent. And he said, Oh, chat GBT did it. And I was floored because I had been, dabbling with it myself and there was no way and I said well what prompt did you give it and so the thing is and he showed me and his what he told it was almost as long as the finished email was in terms of giving it all the the context that it needed to create the email that we needed you know we, we tweaked it still obviously like everybody like everyone's saying you can't just trust it blindly but it, it saves a lot of work in terms of coming up with an initial draft and so I think that's the thing if you t- played with it and and, and I know AI is more than just chat GPT. I'm just focusing on that because that's what's in the limelight right now that um, it, you have to know how to prompt it in order to really get it to, to help you. And it's, and the idea is that you can't just say, yeah, write me a nice email to this client and he's important. So be, be courteous. Like, no, you need to really tell it enough. Just like if you had a human helping you, you, you couldn't, you know, you would have to tell a person a lot of the context in order for them to do their job. Right. So it's the same thing here. I don't know if you guys want to comment on that, but I've noticed all three of you know that, oh, yeah, the way to really get this thing to help you is you have to prompt it correctly. Yeah, and and now you can just sort of drag files into it, too. Um, so you might say, you know, you know, I've been dropped into this court case. Here's the defense and claim, and here's the motions that have been brought. You know, tell me what's going on. Explain that concept to me like I'm five. You know, make a song about it. Like, you know, like you could just have some fun with it and then, you know, help me strategize. Or even like draft me, uh, you know, motion material as a lawyer, um, and it, you know, it's not just a matter of like the art prompt, like trying to be specific in terms of what you want to see. You can create your own little instance of uh, an LLM by feeding, you know, a bunch of documents into it, and then conversing from there. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun, and it's very very powerful. Yeah, what's what's also interesting. Um... Bob, I think you you sort of implicitly touched on this as well. Is that with, with the prompt thing? Um, it, it really, for me, what what that brings up is when people think of intelligence, they think more intelligent or less intelligent uh, in a linear fashion. But really, what it is is intelligence is not linear. I, I feel like they're sort of specialization in a multi-dimensional space and so for example if i was to ask gpt to do some uh complex math equation um directly it may not be able to do that quite well because it's sort of roughly analogous to human intelligence if you want to talk about the way it processes things and the way it reasons but if i was to ask it to write me a program to execute the thing i wanted to do it would actually probably do that much better and I would actually probably get a better result. And that's just because the intelligence model or the model of this AI, the LLM sort of paradigm, is more 
aligned with the way that human intelligence, we believe human intelligence works uh, because it's trained on language uh, and tokens. But as Christian was, was alluding to, there are many other types of AI that are intelligent in different ways. And so the question of more intelligent or less intelligent seems to be um, something that a lot of people get wrong um, when thinking about AI and, and the way that the way that it works. Um, and so I thought that was something interesting that came up for me. Um, Christian, do you have any thoughts on, on, on that? So, yeah, I, I guess I would also push back a little bit on the conception of that it's intelligent in the same way that people are, um, because at, at its core, you know, what it's doing is it's trying to predict the next most probable token. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you think of this as uh, you feed it something, because it, it's basically auto, kind of autocomplete or a stochastic parrot, there are a bunch of different um, ways people have tried to uh understand this and, and communicate it but if you think about um a, a phrase like mary had a um you know what it's trying to do is it's, it's taking all that context that you give and it's going to try to produce what's most probable to come next in this case isn't that what i'm doing too because <laughs> in my i was just gonna say the exact same thing I, see, see, uh, I, do I, we I, understand I, consciousness enough to say whether or not that's exactly what we're doing well, I, I don't know if we do, but th- I, it does seem that there are different modalities here because it doesn't have that same sort of logical inference um, type of approach that uh, that I think humans are using. So I don't think that it's um, it, it's exactly the same or entirely analogous. And this is also this possibly might just be because the, um, we don't really understand how human intelligence works <laughs> to begin with, you know, and so. Um, and so we're kind of grasping around in, in, in the dark with that. But it does seem to me that there are some, some differences with how humans actually go about it, uh, go about decision making and so forth. And I think what's really powerful with with the GPT models or the gen, uh, gender of pre-trained models, the, the, this, um, you know, stochastic period, this autocomplete thing that it's doing, that's just incredibly powerful and far more powerful than I would have you know, imagined, you know, going back when I was playing with these models at first, you know, three, four years ago, um, was that... Uh, you know, this. Th- there are different ways that that uh, that we do think uh, that we do think about things that we plan that we strategize that doesn't that necessarily fit into this um, fit into this uh, the, uh, type of approach of just trying to predict whatever the be- next best word is. And this is really caught the imagination because it does tie, kind of plug into the human API, so to speak. We we think linguistically oftentimes. And so something that can interact with us, I think, is really kind of taking that imagination a lot further. Whereas uh, something like Deep Blue, which uh, beat Gary Kasparov in chess, that was a big you know, moment for computer science back in the late 90s or AlphaGo um, back uh, almost a decade ago now, uh, when that beat the world's best in Go. You know, people don't have that same sort of connection with it because it's, it, it's processing something different and non-linguistically. Can, can, can I ask a quick question? Um, Christian, just because you, you you brought it up, um, and maybe some of the, the folks tuning in have this issue too. So, you know, for people, like, how do these chat GPT and, and the general class of what's called lar- large language models work? Is I've you heard it described, and you just did there, that, oh, it's really just doing probabilities, like saying, when you see this string of words up till now, what is the most likely, you know, next one based on the training data? But what I don't fully get is, the conversation, again, folks, if you haven't seen it, when you're done here, please go check go to my Twitter and look at the, the recent conversation I posted. I asked it here. I, first of all, I posted a, a PNG, a screenshot of Stephanie Kelton's tweet, right? So it interpreted the visual imagery. It wasn't that I typed it in what she said. And I said, explain what she just said. And it did a good job of it. And then I went back and forth with it and really isolate and I got down into things that no one, no human on my Twitter account. Now, in fairness, I didn't like grab someone and try to have a 10 minute conversation with them. So I'm not saying this would be impossible. But in other words, no human being ever in the history of humanity said the exact string of sentences that this thing and I did in that conversation. So it's it's weird. Like when you say Mary had a little. Yeah, I get. Oh, it says lamb. It doesn't really know that Mary had a little lamb. It just knows that's what you say. Or if I say knock, knock, and it says who's there, I can understand. Like, oh, it's been trained on and it knows that. But the the conversation it had with me, like, if that's merely just doing probabilities, okay, but that just seems, like, qualitatively different. Yeah, I, I, I get it. It, it, it. That's why I think it, the approach that, that this technique works is so shocking is because when you have to break it down, it's rather straightforward. What it's doing is it's trying to predict, you know, what comes next. 
But you got to keep in mind that this is a, a very, very complex model. So GPT-3 um, had 175 billion, you know, parameters within the model. And so um, it's it's a very highly nonlinear process um, to, to develop that um, probability distribution that, that that's coming out of it. Um, and, and so that's that's what it's, you know, developing or, or that's what it's working on top of. Uh, and the the results are, are incredibly surprising. They're stunning, you know, um, to, to be able to see that. Um, yeah. So I don't know if, if, if that really answers answers your question per se, but uh that it, it it's it, it's not as it, it seems simple to just say like yeah it's it's the most probable next thing but there's there's a lot of math and, and science that goes behind it and and the training data the corpus that it's been trained on I, I think what's what's interesting about um about this is that so there are sort of two distinct things right so there's the reasoning that occurs or the the engine that processes the inputs and then the actual nature of the outputs and so for example if you tell me Mary had a little, and then I say lamb, the processing that occurred in my brain may actually be fundamentally very different than the processing that occurred uh, that occurs when you say this to a um, a llm. But the outputs are the same, right? And so I think that's where maybe you see um, of the idiosyncrasies when it comes to the uh, the end sort of the end result sometimes. So when you expect GPT to answer a certain way um, or, or the way you have to prompt it uh, is, is in a very, very specific sort of niche way, it's because the things that are happening inside the engine are fundamentally maybe different than the things that are happening in your brain, even if the outputs 99% of the time look quite similar. Um, would you say that's a good characterization? Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think the process is very different, but I don't really have um, that's more intuition, right? Because <laughs> we don't really know exactly what's happening inside inside brains, and these neural networks are, are simplified versions of what we think may have been occurring based on models of you know, that were developed in the forties of um, you know what what we think is going on. Um, so I think that the processes are very very different, but yeah, it's it comes back to you know like I said, tied into the human API, we communicate via language, and so the outputs are so shocking. Um, and so, so powerful because it, it ties into us and, and we connect with it in a way that, uh, that is, that is very surprising. So one question I have also, this is sort of related to the topic as well. Um, the, the investment part of the topic, um, why do you think it, it is the case that large language models that were made, I think for language, um, have become so robust at other tasks that are in completely you would you think separate domains um so for example predicting stock prices or like there's been a lot of different sort of i guess maybe it's something to do with the fact that if you abstract away what a language model is it's just a token predictor and so if you give it a set of past data um it can sort of uh predict the next token and that applies broadly across a bunch of domains but I mean, I haven't seen, like you said, the results were shocking. And the, part of the shockingness of the results of LLMs and the success of LLMs is because they, uh, in in the past, AI that was specifically very good at one sort of domain and one task did it really well. But like, for example, you see an entire field of like NLP being uprooted as a result of these LLMs being, being able to be applied there. So maybe you could speak to that a little bit. That would be really interesting to get your thoughts on. Yeah. I mean, as, as far as, you know, you feed it in a series of prices, a price series and ask it to predict what the, what the next one is. Um, I have, to be honest, I haven't seen those results. I haven't seen those. Um, somebody, somebody do yeah, that. I'd be curious. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I just haven't seen that, um, that work out, but, um, yeah, like I, I think it, it it is amazing how how powerful these systems are, and you know it made me question you know a lot of the the assumptions that that I had kind of going into this and and working in this field because you do see these um, models have been scaling exponentially for a number of years. Uh, like I mentioned, GPT three is one hundred seventy five billion parameters. Um, I don't know how I don't know if they published or released what GPT four is. Last time I checked, it it, it was proprietary, so um, we aren't sure how large it is. Um, maybe they, they've updated that in the past uh, month or two since, since I checked before, but, um, they, uh, the fact that the order of magnitude, uh, I think, right? 
Well, I know the training data is, but I don't know if it's in the trillions of parameters. So, because an order of magnitude would take you to trillions, um, whereas GPT-3 was, was still billions. Um, but I know that they have increased training data and there, there are models that are trained on, you know, uh, trillions of tokens, such as Chinchilla that was developed by Google DeepMind. I think that's 1.4 trillion um, tokens that it was trained on. And I, I'm sorry for those if we're getting parts <laughs> deep into the weeds um, <laughs> with some of this stuff. Um, but it is remarkable that, you know, just by adding more scale uh, by and large over the years, um, more in both terms of the size of the model and the, the tokens or the training data that it, that it has to work with, that it has produced these kind of results. Because if you go back five years ago, um, you'd see these order magnitude increases and you weren't seeing like huge, huge jumps. It seems like that there is maybe a, a tipping point where uh, over a certain level of, of data um, or data and uh, model size, um, you really got this kind of um, somewhat emergent behavior, I suppose, uh, I, I'm using that term rather loosely in this case, uh, where where it's just it's qualitatively different and, and, and seems to be much, much more powerful and, and, and better than what it's done. Uh, and this seems to be able to apply, um, as you mentioned, to to a, a variety of domains. I think ultimately still specialization is going to win. You know, that's something that economics shows us, that evolution shows us. Um, and a number, and you know, really any sort of area of, of, of human um, endeavors that special specialized tools are going to uh, win the day um, for a, a narrow task. Uh, so I don't expect you know these models, you know, ChatGPT to do everything everywhere. Um, but I think that uh, you, you'll have specialization and, and uh, where that's appropriate, that'll still be better. But yeah, these are these will get you quite a decent way. Um, if you, in lack of if, if you're lacking a, a specialized model so are you saying that AGI will never happen <laughs> or will never be effective well that's a different question but um yeah. <laughs> entirely about whether or not that's possible and, and i think that would go down to so all yeah philosophical right so, so AGI is basically this idea that they're uh, artificial general intelligence um and it depends on who you read or who you talk to um on what they mean by that um but what's commonly understood yeah, it was popularized by Nick Bostrom um, uh, a while ago, at least 10, 15 years back, uh, when he published a book about superintelligence, uh, where there is basically a, an artificial intelligence that is better than any human at basically any task and can also improve itself. And it starts to uh, be able to kind of get this sort of runaway um, improvement uh, and, uh, yeah, be, be anything else. Um, I'm skeptical of that uh, for a number of reasons, but uh, I think that would kind of get us into farther, farther down into some rabbit trails and the weeds. So Christian, one more question for you really quickly. Um, when it comes to the scaling uh, sort of phenomena that you mentioned earlier, have you seen that play out in other aspects sort of in, in other um, AI systems other than, for example, LLMs, like the, the qualitative differences that occur with, with scale on LLMs, that seems to have been the shocking thing, right? Is that is that the case with other sort of AI domains as well? Uh, I don't think that there has been quite the same amount of resources uh, poured into other areas. So computer vision was the big one that really kicked off the deep learning revolution um, in 2012, 2011, somewhere thereabouts, uh, where suddenly you had ImageNet and ResNet and a number of other systems that were developed and they got bigger and bigger and that improved, but they were always being met, um, benchmarked against a specific um, uh, data set uh, for accuracy for image classification. And so you went from these hand-tuned models that were like 70% then the deep learning came on and it was suddenly, you know, in the 80s or 90s and then it got better and better from there um, as they got larger and larger. Um, Whereas when we're dealing with these LLMs, it's a little bit different because you don't necessarily have the same sort of benchmark. You know, what's a what's a good measure for for intelligence? You know, some people point to IQ tests and some of these psychometric tests and so forth, but it's not as cut and dry as um, this answer is correct and that answer is, or you know, this image has a cat or it doesn't have a cat. <laughs> you know, whatever whatever the, the test might be. Um, so I don't think you've seen the same sort of scale that's uh, and and resources and investment in some of these other domains because they kind of top out, um, you know, on, on say image classification or so forth. They don't have this kind of uh, hey, we can just keep on pouring more and more and it gets better and better type of approach because um, the it, you know intel like the the, the language approach uh, is just much broader, much more diverse. I think eventually maybe it'll hit that where um, hey, we get to maybe maybe you get to a trillion parameters and uh, well, it, it's better than GPT-4 or, you know, whatever the, the current iteration is, 
but maybe it's not uh, massively better. I think that there will be some sort of um, diminishing returns uh, or some sort of boundary that you wind up hitting. Can, can I jump in here? Um, just again, looking at the the way we build this is AI's economic edge. So I just want to make sure if we can right now at this point, can each of, of the three of you, so I already in the beginning kind of gave my little spiel about, I think even if there were no further progress in chat GPT, businesses just figuring out how do we take the existing abilities and, you know, just effectively like hire a bunch of workers who are pretty competent at various tasks for 250 an hour. And I came up with a back of the envelope, easily 11% one shot bump up in, in US GDP. Um, can you guys just, I, I, I'm not expecting you to give me a number, but like Zuhar, I, one time you made an offhand remark saying, once you really get the hang of this thing, I think you said you thought it would like triple your productivity or something. And and folks, Zuhar is very productive even before <laughs> bringing this into the equation. So can you, each of you maybe just speak a little bit and, and also... I think, are you guys on the cutting edge of this? And really it's more like, oh, so what if, if this triples Zuhar's productivity, once every computer programmer gets on board, they're all going to be at least doubled. You get what I'm saying? Like it's, it's that, is this the kind of thing where it's basically humanity is all of a sudden going to, going to be like twice or three times as productive, even if no further progress happens? Or is this really more of an isolated thing? And oh no, there's only like a few tasks that this is going to augment. Yeah, awesome, awesome question, Bob. Do you want to go first, um, lawyer, and then Christian, and then I'll go. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I mean, so there's a, there's a lot of tasks where, like, I mean, it's hard to imagine where this doesn't affect, um, you know, all, all the businesses that have knowledge workers. And, um, you know, I can't speak to how it affects GDP, but the reality is that, you know, at least in my experience and where we are now, you still have to wrap your head around all the tasks you're completing. So like, I still find myself completely, you know, mentally exhausted doing, you know, I can do more tasks, maybe double or triple in terms of the number and they get done a lot faster, but I still have to like, I'm still thinking a lot, right? It's not like you're getting rid of everybody. I think Zuhar is probably a little closer with the, the tripling of productivity than 10 X. Cause I think there is a limiting factor, which is, you know, you sit down and, and you do five things, even if someone's drafting the email for you and you're reviewing it, you still need to get up and get a coffee or something, right? Like, I mean, unless you're Zuhar and you can do 36 hours staring at your screen. So I think there, there are some limiting factors there. Um, and again, I don't know if we know what GPT-5 looks like. And, you know, at some point, if it looks like a duck and 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 quacks like a duck, you know, I don't know if the, diff- the, diff- the philosophical difference between AGI and just like a, really really smart llm but if the diff if agi just means smarter than all humans i don't know how high of a bar that really is um so you know i i think that's the that's the question is how much more productive does it actually make people and you know those folks that might be lazy at work they're still going to be pretty lazy at work so i don't think it's just 10xing everyone out of the gates but it'll be interesting (laughs) yeah i i I had mentioned that uh, I use it daily. I always have a, you know, uh, a chat GPT type of uh, screen open, um, play with some different models here and there, but uh, just to be able to work faster because sometimes it's just easier to offload some of that uh, that complexity, especially if you're writing code and it's like, okay, this is um, fairly standard. I don't want to think through the next 20 lines. <laughs> Give it a quick prompt and, and it's uh, typically good to go. And it, that can... Um, speed things up a lot and keep you fresh to be able to actually add value where your specialty is and where you know say um, uh, chat GPT isn't so 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 great um, and, and working in that way I find to be to to be great and one of the things that's that's interesting I don't know if you guys have seen this but uh, they did release this AI assistant um, model on uh, uh, chat GPT I think last week they announced it uh, so that now people can start to create their own thoughts um, I haven't seen anything great come out of this yet, but it's only a week old, so we'll see how it goes. But uh, I think that's where we can have a lot of great value, where they're starting to do, um, you know, retrieval augmented generation for specialized processes, and and be able to work on uh, with APIs and in conjunction with other AI systems. Um, and that's where I think uh, some of the tremendous gains are really going to come um, come to fruition is once we can start bringing in uh, some, yeah, some somebody is able to just basically give a command that will run you know a dozen different bots to to bring a full task together that are specialized for their own uh unique capabilities 
Yeah, I, I think Christian, let's speak to plugins. Or, go ahead, uh, Lawyer. Yeah, I was just going to say this. This soon we're going to have OS level stuff, right? And that's going to tie them together. You know, when when Apple or Android or whoever's OS level gets their their AI model there, then you can actually say, you know, hey Siri, draft an email. You know, attach this Word document. You know, book a Zoom meeting and all those things, and presumably it should have no problem figuring out on the OS level how to just get all that done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think any really is sort of like. Um, higher and higher levels of abstraction over smaller and smaller tasks and then gr- putting those smaller tasks together to do bigger tasks right and the, the question is how reliably can that happen at the, this moment in time um, at least when I'm coding when I ask it to generate anything that's longer than yeah like 50 or 100 lines I almost always have to tweak things uh, in order to get it to run properly um, and so but I feel like that has gotten better. And I don't know if that scales infinitely and that I become redundant because I'm just a person who is delegating to this system and the system's delegating to plugins and sort of that hierarchy. If you can replace the top of the hierarchy, well, then you solve productivity. <laughs> and then, um, I mean, that's an infinity X multiplier <laughs> in a way if you think about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, is that the is that where this process leads or is there a cap, like you were saying? Um who knows? But I think that what's what's really interesting is the um, the way that that things are going. Um, it does seem like things are improving month by month, week by week. Um, so with the GPT uh, assistant that came out, so before that came out at Infinio, we were using an actual third party startup um, in order to sort of fine tune domain knowledge into GPT in order to create what we call AI Bob. Uh, so we, we actually have an AI version of Dr. Murphy um, that's used internally for um, its domain expertise in everything that we do with respect to whole life insurance and the company, et cetera. You could ask it about company history. You could ask it about compliance policies, things like that. And so it was meant to be a resource. It would join your, your Google Meets and it would um, basically speak as if it was Bob Murphy um, with Bob's voice and uh, and be able to have a conversation with you. But we were using a third-party fine-tuning tool to do that, and now um, OpenAI has built that right into the to the system, which is a custom GPT, and you can upload knowledge documents and it'll, it'll be able to sort of understand, uh, understand them and be, build a GPT based on that. And so what's interesting is that development killed like 10 startups <laughs> with one update. Um, and so it, it really is like there's a consolidation of productivity enhancement going on in the hands of OpenAI and the other large uh, large players. It's quite interesting what's happening. But I do think that um, the breakneck pace is going to be something to watch. And then also the, the massive amount of um, productivity that's going to come, come of it and, and the distribution of the results of that productivity, uh, how that looks when it comes to like the, the, the few companies that capture a lot of the gains <laughs> and uh, being early to, to sort of even leveraging the tools, I think is really important for any company nowadays. It's like so, so much disruption is going to happen in the next five, not even five, maybe three years um, by, by people leveraging these tools for process optimization, which is my, my obsession. So yeah, Bob, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's an exciting time. There's a lot to consider. And um like, yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be a wild ride. Um, Christian, can you uh, maybe speak? So I I, I don't want to make it just sound like oh yeah, AI is is synonymous with ChatGPT. So can you speak a little bit? You know, whether from your own experience or just things you've seen about like how is AI in other realms besides mere large language models transforming industry? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so I guess from my area of expertise, as, as I mentioned, it's it's on reinforcement learning and optimization. So um, it's really on the decision making process uh, for systems. So uh, you know when you're dealing with say um, supply chains or, or you know physical products, physical processes, and so forth, um, you know it's it's very difficult. Like, like I, I, I wouldn't trust the output of an LLM for that, <laughs> for example, to give it all the inputs to say, okay, where do we ship this, you know, um, hazardous chemical or, or something along those lines. 
Um, so you're able to actually build a lot of these uh, these systems and typically uh, train them using something called like Monte Carlo simulation, which is basically just a a, a way to to train something over and over again by running in simulate by running a simulation. Um, so it's able to see a wide variety of different um, outcomes and and futures and so forth, and then able to uh, take that and actually make decisions in the real physical world based on that. Um, and so some of these re reinforcement learning um, techniques are being used in ChatGPT. So you've probably seen, um, if you're if you're close to the space, uh, the acronym RLHF, so reinforcement learning with human feedback. And this is how ChatGPT um, tries to uh, tampen down some of the more outrageous statements that, um, sorry, OpenAI tries to tampen down uh, some more outrageous statements that uh, uh, ChatGPT might be making otherwise or to promote other statements or if you have like a, uh, a thumbs up, thumbs down, um, that's reinforcement learning. So it's giving it that sort of feedback to say, hey, do more of this in the future or do less of this in the future. And so you could apply that to um, to operations research processes, uh, to um, uh, other areas for, for say pricing, if you're trying to book, a, book an airline tickets to uh, a lot of these other things where you know, language might not necessarily be the best approach uh, going forward. So um, would you have an LLM drive your your Tesla do for autopilot? No, you know, it's a different type of AI system that's that's being used in those in those areas that combines computer vision and these uh, process control type of reinforcement learning models. Great. Um, I think we're at time. Uh, Bob, is there anything else that you wanted to come? Uh, yeah, sure. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And again, I would just point people, the, the pattern we're doing with these Twitter spaces or X spaces is uh, we're, we're covering the material from the prior Friday's um, InFi podcast, which is Infinio's podcast that I, I'm the host of. So Christian was our guest last week. So if you if you like the kind of stuff you're hearing in this particular conversation, by all means, I would encourage you to go to Infinio.ai. And you can look up the the Infi podcast archives there and Christian's most recent one. But other than that, thanks everybody uh, for tuning in and thanks to our guests. Thank you so much, guys. Great combo. Take care. Thanks. See you next week. <laughs>